Appreciate it. And tonight, we are resuming our study of 1 Corinthians 13 as we continue to look at the way that the Apostle Paul describes how someone who loves behaves. As you'll recall, after beginning the chapter by using himself as a hypothetical illustration of someone who ministered, but ministered without love, so that his ministry, while looking on the outside to be very impressive, was actually fruitless and of no real eternal value. The Apostle Paul then, having stated that in verses 1 through 3, then starting with verse 4, he begins to list 15 specific ways that love conducts itself. And he begins to describe love by presenting it in a, in a very positive way, saying that love is patient, love is kind. However, starting with the very next description of love, the third one, Paul switches from presenting love in a positive way to presenting it in a negative way, saying love is not jealous, love does not brag, and love is not arrogant. In other words, he's saying that someone who loves is not jealous of others. Someone who loves doesn't brag about themselves. Someone who loves doesn't think he's better or superior to other people. And as Paul continues his list of the way that love behaves, he continues along the lines of presenting love in the same negative fashion, telling us what someone who loves others doesn't do. Because the very next way he tells us how love behaves, found at the beginning now of verse 5, is that he says, love does not behave or does not act unbecomingly. So what does that mean? Well, the word unbecomingly, it's not a word that most of us are familiar with. It's just not a part of our normal, everyday vocabulary. So unless we understand exactly what this word means, we won't have any clue as to what the Apostle Paul is saying, what he's teaching. Well, the Greek word that is translated unbecomingly means to behave indecently or, or in a shameful manner. And the basic thought, folks, behind this word is that to behave unbecomingly is to behave rudely. It's to be ill-mannered. It's to act in a way that is contrary to established standards of decency. In essence, someone who acts unbecomingly is rude. They're rude so that they act in a way that has no concern, no consideration for anyone else but themselves. Now, the reason Paul includes rudeness in this list of how love behaves, or really how it doesn't behave, is because this attitude of rudeness, it was a major problem in the Corinthian church. And they weren't even aware of it, but they were a rude people. Where, where did they act in this unbecoming, rude, ill-mannered way towards one another? Well, there are several examples in, the, in, in what we read about the Corinthians. For example, they were rude in the way they had no consideration for their brothers and sisters in Christ who had a, a, a weaker conscience than they did, a weak conscience that would not allow them to eat food sacrificed to idols. You remember, we covered that in chapter 8. They didn't care. They just didn't care if by eating this kind of food that this upset their weaker conscienced brethren, so they ate whatever they wanted to eat. That was rude, and that was the way that love does not behave. Love would have been considerate of the weaker brethren and would have refrain from eating food sacrificed to an idol. Love would have said, out of, out of love, I know I have this right to eat this food, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be in any way harming my weaker brother or sister in Christ. They lacked love. They were rude in that area. In addition, the Corinthians were rude in that the wealthy members of the congregation did not wait for the poorer members of the congregation to arrive at the church before engaging in eating what we call the agape love feast and the Lord's Supper. It was rude and it was loveless. They just ate. They were gluttonous. They didn't care 
about the brethren who couldn't get there, people who were slaves and, and had, to be wait, had to wait to be released from their responsibilities. And when we get to chapter 14, we'll see that the members of this church were rude to each other when they met for corporate worship. One Bible teacher explained exactly how they were so ill-mannered in their church meetings. He said this, he said, during congregational meetings, certain gifted speakers were monopolizing the time and hindering others from expressing their spiritual gifts. Then there were those who interrupted while others were speaking. Some spoke in tongues without interpretation, so the people didn't know what was being said. To put an end to their ill-mannered impropriety, Paul instructed in chapter 14, verse 40, that all things should be done decently and in order. And he said that because they were not behaving that way. Now, folks, this is exactly why Paul is making the point here in chapter 13 that love is not rude. It's because the Corinthians were rude. They were terribly rude, and he wants them to be aware of this, and he wants them to stop it. But just because we don't display rudeness in the exact same way that the Corinthians did, it doesn't mean that we're not rude. There are lots of ways that Christians can be, and Christians are rude. So let me bring to your attention just a sampling, just a few ways that we can can exhibit rudeness. One way that we can be rude is something that we don't think much about, but it's something that I used to do quite frequently, and that is to be late for a meeting with someone. When Michelle and I were dating in college, we agreed to meet at a certain time on on campus so that we could have dinner together in the school cafeteria. That was just something we, we always did. But I would constantly, consistently show up late, making her wait for me. There, there's no excuse for that. This was, this was rude, it was thoughtless, it was insensitive, it was selfish, and it was ill-mannered because I had no consideration for Michelle's time or her schedule because the only thing I was thinking about and the only one I was thinking about was me. It was only years later. I mean, I did this consistently throughout our, our years at, at college, but it was years later when I heard someone speak about this, about... He said that when someone is late for a meeting with someone else, it's because they're selfish. And when I heard that, I was deeply grieved in my heart because he was exactly right, and I repented of my sin of being so rude, so inconsiderate of Michelle and other people, other people that I often was late to meeting with. Now, let me balance balance this by saying there certainly are times when we can't help being late for a meeting. When things are beyond our control, we call those extenuating circumstances. I'm not talking about that. But to be late for a meeting with someone when circumstances are under your control, it's just wrong. Because it's a total disregard for that other person's time and schedule. It's just rude. It demonstrates a lack of love. One of the things I admire about the godly Robert Chapman, one of my heroes, As I've told you, he was an English pastor in the early Brethren movement in the 1800s. One of the things I greatly admire about Chapman is how considerate he was of other people's times, time and their schedules and their circumstances. His biographer writes this about Robert Chapman. He said, (coughs) Chapman always thought of the good of others. For example, He began and concluded meetings on time, for he knew that many of those attending were servants who were expected to return to their duties at a specific time. Unlike many others of his day, he scheduled annual Christian conferences to serve the needs of those who attended rather than for the speaker's convenience. He always ended conference meetings on time to allow adequate time for participants to catch their trains home. Good for him. He was not rude. Not rude. No, I mean, no wonder Robert Chapman was known for his love. He was considerate of others in the scheduling and ending of meetings. That was a mark of love. But being late and inconsiderate of other people's times, that's only one way. Only one way that, that demonstrates rudeness and being ill-mannered. There, there are other ways that we can be rude, and not even, and that's the point, not even being, be aware of it, 
For example, we're rude when we're harsh, and we are blunt, and we are tactless in the way we speak to others, excusing it as, well, that's just the way I am. I, I say what's on my mind. But being tactless in speech, it's unloving. It's unloving because it has no consideration for the feelings of the person that you're speaking to. The loving thing to do would be to spend some time thinking, asking the Lord to help you to say the same thing, but in a gracious, kind manner. We are to speak the truth in love. Another way we demonstrate rudeness is when we are impolite and discourteous to others, especially when they share opinions that we disagree with. We live in a culture where it's become the norm to put anybody down who disagrees with us. It is not uncommon these days to hear public speakers being booed, hissed, hissed at, heckled, all that. It's just plain rudeness. It comes under that category of rudeness and it should never be the behavior of a Christian. Those who display such disgraceful rudeness have no concern for the speaker's feelings. All they're thinking about is themselves. But love does not behave that way, no matter how strongly you disagree. Even if you disagree with someone, you are to politely listen to them and show respect. That's how love behaves. One, be, one Bible teacher put it this way. He said, talking over people, not listening, ignoring other people's ideas, making cutting comments and threats, bullying, and showing disrespect to those who disagree does not exemplify love. As Western societies become more coarse and thoughtless of basic standards of courtesy and social decency, we must resist the acceptance of rude behavior. If not, it will have a harmful, degrading effect on our lives and on our churches. So these days, we're just seeing a, a, a large display of rudeness like we've never seen before in our society, especially in the political arena, where people feel they have a license to just be nasty these days to anyone who holds a differing position. Politicians who used to at least show some common courtesy to others now tend to show no restraint in their verbal assaults. As believers in Christ, we have to resist this. We're to be different because to act this way is to be unloving to others. Even those who hold to views that are diametrically opposed to biblical standards. Politicians who verbally demean others are not to be the examples we follow. We follow Jesus Christ. He's our example, who was never rude, never impolite. Now, the Lord spoke boldly, but the issue was always the truth, not personal attacks, not demeaning people. He was never rude. Another way that we have to guard ourselves against being rude is by the way we dress. So let me explain. What I'm specifically referring to is when a Christian woman dresses inappropriately by wearing something that is immodest, dressing in a way that could cause a Christian brother to stumble. This comes under the category of being unbecoming because not only is it indecent and contrary to the established standards of appropriate moral behavior, but it is a loveless attitude towards her brothers in Christ who struggle with moral lust. It's rude because it's the attitude of, well, I'll dress any way I want to dress. It's their problem if they struggle with lust. It's not mine. That attitude is a total disregard for others. And, and therefore, this attitude is loveless. It, it is rude. It is inappropriate. It is ill-mannered. A Christian woman who loves her brothers in Christ dresses in a way that would never intentionally cause them to stumble because she puts their interests ahead of her interests. Now, and I could hear a pin drop speaking about this. You're very attentive about this. Now, those are just a few examples, just, just a sampling of how we can so easily be rude. So be careful, be aware. In all your actions, be considerate of other people, of their time, of their schedules, their feelings, and their moral purity. Love isn't rude because it is thoughtful and it is caring about others. 
Now, one man who was very mindful, very considerate of others was the Apostle Paul. Not only did he teach that love is not rude, Paul lived. He lived this truth out. As a traveling evangelist, a a missionary church planter, Paul moved in and out of varying cultures. (coughs) He ministered to religious, observant Jewish people in Jewish circles, and he ministered in pagan Gentile circles. And each of these cultures, each of them had very different standards of what was socially acceptable. And Paul adjusted, adjusted to those standards, though Paul never compromised the gospel message so as to make it sound more appealing to anyone. (coughs) He did make sure that he personally adapted, and that's the key, he personally adapted to the social values of whatever culture he found himself in. This is exactly what Paul was referring to when he wrote these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 19. He said, though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who were under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that I might by all means save them. Paul was willing to make changes. He he was willing to make changes in the way he dressed. He was willing to make changes in the way he talked. When he was in different groups, he was willing to make changes in the foods that he ate. In certain circles, it was not acceptable, and so he didn't do that. And and he behaved this way simply because he loved people, and because he loved people, he wanted to win them to Christ. And he longed for them to have faith in Christ, and so he respected them. He showed them common courtesy by not violating their traditions and their social customs so as to have... He wanted an unhindered opportunity for the gospel, and he wasn't about to hinder it by insisting on his own rights, which comes under the category of rudeness. Paul, Paul is the man who's a model for us. Jesus, the perfect example, but Paul's a model for us, not nasty politicians who speak inflammatory words. We need to follow Paul's example in loving others by not being rude and inconsiderate. And so love, the apostle says, it is not rude. It's not ill-mannered. And as Paul continues to explain to us how love behaves, he lists yet another way that love does not behave. He writes, love does not seek its own. Now, the way that these words are translated varies from one Bible version to another. If you have different Bible versions at home, you can check this out. They all translate it slightly differently. One version translates it, for example, as love does not insist on its own way. Another says love never seeks its own advantage. Still another says love is not self-seeking. Although each of these Bible versions, yes, they, they vary in the way they translate the apostles' words. They all are conveying the same basic message, and that is that love is not selfish. Love's not selfish because that's really what the apostle is saying. It's not self-centered. It isn't selfish. It isn't self-focused. Those who love others don't focus on themselves and getting their own way. They focus on others so that they seek what is best for them. And frankly, frankly, we are all challenged by this because at the very core of our fallen human natures is a heart of selfishness, seeking what we want rather than what God wants. In fact, this is really the very reason that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden of Eden. It was because they sought what they wanted, what they thought would benefit them rather than seeking what God wanted and what would please him. This is why one Bible commentator said this. He said, cure selfishness and you have just replanted the Garden of Eden. Now the Corinthians, again, they had a serious problem with being selfish. And some of this carried over from rudeness. Some of this goes 
back and forth, rudeness and selfishness, they're connected. Their selfishness was on display in, in a number of ways. For example, they were selfish in the way they refused to give up again. Food that had been sacrificed to an idol. It was rude, but it was selfish. They did this because they only cared about themselves. They didn't care about the weaker brother. They, they would rather a fellow Christian stumble spiritually than give up their so-called right to eat food, the food that they wanted to eat. This was pure selfishness. It, it was just a lack of love. And throughout chapters 8, 9, and 10, Paul speaks of that. It's unloving, he says. They were also selfish in the way they refused again to share their food at these love feasts. They're rude, but they're selfish. They were selfish in that in the name of protecting their own interests, they sued one another in pagan courts. They were also selfish in pursuing the most showy, attention-grabbing spiritual gifts. They thought nothing of using their spiritual gifts for the edification of others. That, that wasn't a part of what they, they did. They were only seeking to make themselves look good by exhibiting these public speaking gifts. They never thought about building up others. They never thought about using their gifts to help others. This is why in chapter 14, Paul will say in verse 12, so also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Paul said this, folks, because they weren't doing this. They were only seeking spiritual gifts to build themselves up in the eyes of others, and it was completely unloving, completely. Listen, unsaved people are characterized by selfish hearts because that's all they have. They don't have the spiritual capacity to be unselfish. So for an unsaved person, life generally, it's all about themselves, what's best for them regardless of how it affects others. You see, for an unsaved person, he or she, they're, they're the center of the universe. The world revolves around them, revolves around their interests. But for those of us who know Christ, we do have the capacity to be unselfish. We very much have the capacity because at salvation, the Lord has planted within us that new nature the divine nature, and he's also given us the Holy Spirit who enables us to say no to self-interest as we lovingly seek the welfare of others. We aren't compelled to live selfish lives. We're not enslaved to that. The more we grow in Christ, and that's the key, the more we become like Christ. And Jesus was the epitome of being unselfish. And so we read, for example, in Romans chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification, for even Christ did not please himself. Jesus did not live to please himself. He lived to please the Father, and therefore we are to live to please God too. And one way we do this is by seeking the welfare of others. Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, verse 27, he said, but I am among you as one who serves. Jesus lived to serve others, not himself, not himself. And that's exactly how we, his followers, are to live. That's certainly how, again, the apostle Paul lived. Paul's life was all about putting the interests of others ahead of his own interests. And so Paul not only told the Corinthians that love does not seek its own, he modeled that, that very virtue before them. For example, and I read this earlier, in chapter 9, verse 19, he said concerning himself, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. Again, in chapter 10, verse 33, the apostle said this of himself, just as I also also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. And then I love this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said these remarkable words about himself in verses 14 and 15. He said, here for this third time, I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden to you, for I do not seek what is yours, but you. For children are not responsible to save up for their parents, but parents for their children 
And then listen to this. I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. Listen, if, if you're going to be loving as the Bible defines love, not our society, but the Bible, then you must set your own interests aside to give yourself unselfishly to others. This involves giving them your time, your resources, your energy, your attention, and at times even your possessions. Here's how Alexander Strzok in his book about love describes those who are unselfish. He said, they put themselves out to serve others. They reach out to people in need. They are self-forgetful and ultimately self-renouncing. They don't belong to themselves and they're not concerned about being unfairly treated. They're not worried about being repaid or even properly thanked. They are godly people who look not only to their own interests, but as Paul said in Philippians 2, 4, but also to the interests of others. So tonight, we, we have learned two ways that love behaves by learning how love doesn't behave. Love, Paul says, is not rude. It is considerate of others. It cares about how its behavior affects others. It's well-mannered. It has regard for the feelings of others. So ask the Lord to help you in this area. I'm telling you that so many times we're rude and we just don't even, we're not even aware of this. So ask the Lord to make you aware of how you may be rude so that you can change this. As I said, for many years, many years, I was just unaware that my tardiness was an act of unloving rudeness towards Michelle and many others who I just would come, come late. So ask the Lord for awareness and help in this area. Secondly, you learn that love is not selfish, meaning that it seeks and puts the welfare of others ahead of itself. So ask the Lord again to show you where you've been selfish, to help you to make changes so that you are preoccupied, not with yourself, but with serving others. And if you've never trusted Christ for your salvation, understand that because he willingly gave of himself to die as a substitute for sinners, the most unselfish act in history, you can have eternal life if you'll only repent of your sin and believe on Christ for salvation. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, these are such practical truths, and sometimes we are just so unaware of where we've been rude, we, where we've been unselfish. Lord, it's so easy for us to conform to this world. We hear politicians, we hear people, we hear people in the media who are just, they're always yelling at each other, demeaning each other, strongly strongly disagreeing with verbal assaults. Lord, that, that's not to be us. Help us to not be conformed to this world, but to see Christ, to be those who are never ill-mannered, who never put our own interests ahead of others. E even where we, we know that we're right on a biblical issue, Lord, help us to never be rude, to never be indecent in, in the way that we speak or behave with others and help us to be those who are so un, unselfish, Lord, like, like Paul, to make adjustments, to put others first, to esteem others more important than ourselves. Lord, these are, these are our standards, so help us to shine forth in a world that knows nothing about this. And we pray if there's anyone here or watching who's never trusted Christ, they might recognize the unselfishness of Christ's sacrifice, that it was for sinners like them, and they would repent of their sin and come to faith in you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.